Let's talk about the surgical options. So let's say if at all there is a patient with a renal cell carcinoma, what can we offer to this particular patient? We have two options. We can either go ahead with a partial nephrectomy or we can go ahead with a radical nephrectomy. Let's talk about the surgical options. So let's say if at all there is a patient with a renal cell carcinoma, what can we offer to this particular patient? We have two options. We can either go ahead with a partial nephrectomy or we can go ahead with a radical nephrectomy. Now, believe me or not, this was the question which was asked in recent NEET PG examination. Okay, literally NEET PG examination, they had asked you, so they can definitely ask you. They ask you what is an indication of a partial nephrectomy. Please remember, if at all the size of the tumor is less than four centimeters, okay, like, uh, that is T1A lesion. Okay, so T1A, that is the size of the tumor is less than 4 centimeters. This is an indication of a partial nephrectomy. Please remember this point. Okay, now for those who are preparing for the urology, what you need to understand, according to your Campbell, even T1B lesions, they can be considered depending on the various uh, factors taken into consideration. But even till 7 centimeters, you may consider a partial nephrectomy. But we are here on the general surgery aspect. So for general surgery, just remember straightforward, less than four centimeters, we go ahead with a partial nephrectomy. Okay, done. Now, what are the other things? So it is all logical, man. It is completely logical. So let's say if at all the person is having a single kidney and the patient is having a renal cell carcinoma, would you remove the entire kidney? No, not really. You will go ahead with a partial nephrectomy. Let's say if at all there is a patient who is having von hippel lindau syndrome. So we do understand that if at all there is any hereditary syndrome, then the patient might come to you with a bilateral disease. So hereditary disease, hereditary syndrome, the patient might come to you with a bilateral disease. Let's spare the kidney, right? So one hippel lindau disease, the patient is coming to you with the RCC. What is the answer? Partial effect. I hope it makes sense, right? It is all logic. So let me just walk you through it. Size less than four centimeters. You need to remember this. RCC in the solitary kidney, obviously bilateral RCCs. Okay, definitely. Now, RCC with the diseased contralateral kidney, other kidneys having, let's say, diabetic nephropathy or something. Obviously, partial nephrectomy. Okay. Now, if at all you perform a partial nephrectomy, obviously the complications are a bit more because you are kind of cutting the kidney into two halves. So, patient might have hematuria, perirenal hematoma, urinary fistula, and the infection. So, these are the couple of complications which might occur a bit more as compared to the other nephrectomies. And all. Okay. Nothing very significant. That's fine. Now, let's talk about the radical nephrectomy. So, let's say if at all there is a patient who is having larger tumor, let's say 10 centimeters and no other comorbidity or something like that. Obviously, we are going to go ahead with a radical nephrectomy. Now, in this, what you need to understand is that even if the patient is having a metastatic tumor, would you still go ahead with a nephrectomy? The answer is yes, because what was the most common presentation of a renal cell carcinoma? Hematuria, right? So do you want the patient to kind of keep on losing the blood and patient might continue to have that anemia and everything? Not really. So for this, we perform something which is called as a cytoreductive nephrectomy. Okay. So we basically perform something which is called as a cytoreductive nephrectomy. It is not going to change the prognosis of this particular patient. Patient might die like whatever is destined, but it is going to definitely improve the quality of life. And you know, anime and all, it is going to be kind of controlled. So cytoreductive nephrectomy is done. If at all, there is a patient who is having a metastatic tumor. Now, what about the adrenals? Adrenals, it depends. Like if at all the adrenals is involved, you may remove it, but if at all the adrenal is not involved, it is not mandatory. So even when the radical nephrectomy, it is not mandatory to remove the adrenals. And you kind of remove the ureter till your pelvic brain. Okay. So this is how you basically perform a radical nephrectomy. Now, very, very important thing, which you might think is, what about the lymph nodes? So do you perform a lymph node dissection in every patient of a renal cell carcinoma? The answer is big no. Please understand this point. Okay. So prophylactic lymph node dissection is not done. If at all, let's say there is an enlarged lymph node on, let's say, certain investigation or palpation or something like that. If at all the enlarged lymph node is present, then you have to go ahead with a prof like then you have to go ahead with the neck dissection. But a prophylactic neck dissection, you don't have to go. Did you understand this particular point, guys? Yeah. Okay. Right. Now, coming to the management of a metastatic renal cell carcinoma. Now, believe me or not. All these drugs are given in your loving belly. So those who are preparing for urology, I'm sure that you guys must be aware of this. For others, all these drugs are given in love and belief, so you should be kind of aware of this, okay? So the first part, like the first segment, you definitely would have heard of this. So tyrosine kinase inhibitors, okay? So tyrosine kinase inhibitors are kind of the drugs which you use for the metastatic RCC, which includes the sorafenib, sunitinib, pazopinib, and axitinib. Out of this, sunitinib is the one which is usually more effective in the metastatic RCC. Please remember this, okay? What about the sorafenib? 
recently they have approved sorafenib for a metastatic hepatocellular carcinoma please remember this guys okay it has been shown to kind of have a bit of a survival benefit as well but yeah for the renal cell carcinoma sunitinib is better both can be used sunitinib is better i'm sure that you guys must have heard of this now let's move ahead mTOR inhibitors so what are the mTOR inhibitors which we use in the patients with the renal cell carcinoma it is everolimus and the temsorolimus okay so these are the mTOR inhibitors now this is something which is a really hot topic and they keep on asking you even in the urology at least the names they keep on asking you so please do remember it guys okay so this is what is called as the t cell immune checkpoint inhibitors in this we have two categories the first is antibody against the programmed cell death protein 1 ligand 1 okay so it is called as a pd uh, pd1 l1 inhibitors okay so this is basically antibody against your programmed cell death protein 1 ligand 1 what are the examples of this we have avilumab and we have atezolizumab just go through this guys these names are given in lemon billy can be asked so avilumab and atezolizumab these are the uh, programmed cell death protein 1 ligand 1 inhibitors the other category is antibodies against the programmed cell death protein 1 that is what is a pd1 inhibitor so don't get confused in the pd1 category we have nivolumab and pembrolizumab now this is a kind of favorite they keep on asking you this pembrolizumab so please understand it is a programmed cell death protein 1 inhibitor it is not a programmed cell death protein 1 ligand 1 no not really ligand 1 is basically your avilumab and atezolizumab okay please go through this okay i am not sure whether they are going to ask you in the general surgery part or not but believe me or not this is something which is given in your lemon billy should know okay so with this we are done with the renal cell carcinoma now let's move on to the smaller topics which is your upper urinary tract transitional cell carcinoma and the wilms tumor now we are going to talk about the upper urinary tract transitional cell carcinoma now what do you understand by a transitional cell carcinoma so the carcinoma which is basically arising from the transitional cell okay now we have this transition epithelium in the renal pelvis in the ureter in the bladder so from all these particular places what you basically get is a transitional cell carcinoma now upper urinary tract transitional cell carcinoma basically is dealing with your renal pelvis okay so when we talk about this what you need to understand is that around 5 to 10% of the total renal tumors they are basically consisting of your upper urinary tract tcc okay that is the first thing now what is the risk factor the very very important risk factor for this is smoking as it is true for your bladder carcinoma so smoking is the kind of the most important risk factor for your transitional cell carcinoma now when we talk about the clinical features gross hematuria so if you remember even when we talked about the renal cell carcinoma i told you that the most common presenting feature is hematuria but that is all the more true for your upper urinary tract transitional cell carcinoma okay so hematuria is the manifestation of transitional cell carcinoma now a unique thing which you really need to understand over here is urinary cytology or to be specific it is urinary cytology for malignant cells what is it and why do we do it over here we never talked about this when we talked about the renal cell tumor right but here we are talking about this because transitional cell carcinoma has a characteristic feature whatever the cells are there in the transitional cell carcinoma they are poorly cohesive what do you understand by poorly cohesive that they are not very well bound with each other okay so the cells are poor cohesive like they are poorly cohesive so they can get detached and they can be kind of shed out into the urine and via the urine they can basically travel down into the bladder and come out through the urine and we can detect it this is a characteristic feature which helps us in using this urine for malignant cytology for the upper urinary tract transitional cell carcinoma now is it really sensitive not really every time this particular phenomenon is not going to happen in fact the sensitivity is very less it is close to 50 to 55% but when we talk about the specificity it is really high in other words it means that if at all you have a positive malignant cytology there is very like you are very sure that you know at some place or the other there is a transitional cell carcinoma present whether it is in the bladder or upper tcc or the ureter or something there is a tcc present okay right so this is a use of your urine for malignant cytology now one of the very important complications of upper urinary tract tcc is it can come down and it can get implanted into the bladder leading to a bladder carcinoma this happens close to 40% of the patients okay so this is what is called as a downward migration of that particular tumor like it started with the upper tract tcc and then it kind of downward migrated and now you have a tcc in your bladder okay and last thing which you really need to understand over here is treatment so when we talked about the renal cell carcinoma what did i tell you what is the treatment it is a radical nephrectomy but please understand here the treatment is radical nephrourectomy so here not just removing the 
kidney along with that you are removing the entire ureter and you are also removing the cuff of the urinary bladder so just remember radical nephro is a treatment for your upper urinary tract disease okay